Welcome to the Web Weekly Highlights. My name is Dan Walleen, and we're all the way up to episode seven. In this episode, we have a lot of great stuff to cover. We're going to talk about everything ranging from Knockout JS computed observables to cryptography in JavaScript, which there's some pretty cool stuff to show you there. And we'll even talk about some AngularJS, how to organize AngularJS projects, especially big ones. And we have quite a bit more. So let's go ahead and jump right in. If you've used Knockout.js before, you'll know that it's an excellent client-side data binding library that really simplifies a lot of the code we used to have to write and makes it easy to track if a property changes, update a text box, and vice versa. Well, if you've dealt with Knockout, or even if you haven't, it can do something called computed observables. And these are properties that are really aggregates in most cases. You might take, for instance, a name, and that's composed of first name and last name. You just want to put them together. Well, in a great post titled, Getting the Most Out of Knockout.js Computed Observables, Ryan Niemeyer goes pretty deep into what a computed observable is and a lot of the different features that are available. So let me scroll on down here. He talks about not only reading and generating like name, but also intercepting writes, talks about tracking multiple dependencies, deferring the initial evaluation of a computer property, and actually a whole lot more. So if you're building Knockout JS applications and using this data binding with computed observables, definitely a great post to check out. One of the questions I've had a lot lately is regarding cryptography and local storage. And the question is basically, hey, how do I secure the data that's going in local storage in HTML5 type apps? And there's a lot of different answers you can give, but one of the safe ones is that, well, you send the data up to the server, it encrypts it, gives you that back, and then you put that into local storage. Of course, then when you pull it out to decrypt it, you're going to have to send it back up to the server, and you have the whole round trip. Well, there's a library out there called Crypto.js, and this actually does a lot of the more complex algorithms, some of the simple ones, some of the complex ones, and it has these built in, and it's a very active project uh, that you can get into. So scrolling on down here, you'll notice that we have the standard hashing algorithms. We have SHA-1, MD5, and there's a quite a bit of details here about how to use them. And then moving on down, you can also do some of the AES and triple uh, DES and even more. And they have a lot of good details you can drill into, a lot of sample code on how to use it, encrypt it, and how that all works. So of course, you always have to be careful how the key is stored. But assuming you take care of that, usually with the server, then this would provide a way that you could encrypt or decrypt locally and uh, have access to not only hashing, but also some of the true encryption decryption features. So check it out if you're interested in cryptography in JavaScript. One of the ways that I'm always struggling as I build new applications is where do I get the initial data, especially if I'm working on the client UI piece initially. And usually what I'll do is just hard code some data somewhere and kind of go that route. But if you want a more realistic example, but also want to work with real data. Now, it might be hard-coded data, but at least it's a real Ajax call or whatever it may be. You might want to check out jasonstub.com. It provides a great and a really easy way to get started stubbing out data so that you can get some data in place, not be all focused about you know, database interaction or routing on the server side or whatever it may be, and you can just make your Ajax calls directly. Now, what I like about this site is that it provides a really easy way to walk through step by step and get some data in. It also provides some scripts that you can use. Let me scroll down a little more. You'll see we have jQuery, kind of a starter code here, and you put in your uh, key and project key, and that's kind of how it looks up your sample data. You have Ember, Angular, and curl here, just as a general curl HTTP request. So this provides a really easy way, if you're interested, to get that data going so that you can get focused on the UI and not be so hung up on how the server side is going. So check out jasonstub.com if you're interested in that type of functionality. I recently did a new post that answered some other questions I've been having from people regarding single page applications. A lot of people are wondering if they're already working a lot in the server, if those skills kind of get thrown out, and now you have to jump from maybe ASP.NET or PHP or Python or whatever you're doing and jump right into JavaScript and kind of forget everything else you did. And the answer there, I think, especially for robust applications, is no. You definitely don't have to throw out all those skills if you're going to be working a lot with SPAs. 
Sure, you are going to have to learn a lot of JavaScript. That's just kind of how it goes nowadays. But I put together a post titled, What's the Role of the Server in Single Page Applications? Because I've had this question, as mentioned, come up a lot. And I walked through some different scenarios ranging from security to validation. And then I also highlight security again, because if you do a lot with JavaScript, you'll know that you know, JavaScript is a very frail solution for security. We, of course, have to validate everything on the server side. And that includes validating things as well. So if you're interested in thinking through some of the different ways that a server would still be used with SPAs, then this post will walk you through some of those. Everything from the normal, which is creating a RESTful type service, we'll talk about data caching, and one of my favorite ways that a server could be used is you might actually, instead of serving up static HTML templates or views, compose those and create them dynamically on the server based on security or other needs of your application. So there's a lot of ways that the server can still be involved. And I think, uh, especially with some of the companies we're working with that have more robust SPA needs, that it's something you really need to think through. The traditional SPA relies on a lot of static templates, and that's most of the demos you'll see. But I think that can definitely change based on your security and caching needs. So if you want more information, check out the post. One of the technologies that we're hearing a lot about nowadays is WebSockets, and for good reason. It provides a great way for a server to actually push data to multiple clients. And for instance, in a financial app, it offers a way that you can have live up to the second information. Well, another technology that's maybe a little lesser known, but kind of related to WebSockets is WebRTC. And in this post on pix.io, there's some information about what WebRTC is. It's kind of peer-to-peer -peer networking and different ways you can use it. They walk through and even provide a video on how you can use this technology for messaging between clients and how you can send pictures back and forth directly between clients and even how WebSockets and a server could fit into this when you want to hook up multiple clients together and get them talking. So if you're interested in this type of technology, it's actually a great read with a lot of good information. As you're building single page applications and you add more and more files into it, you may wonder about the best way to structure the application. Now this can be everything from how do we structure the folders to the code itself. Maybe you have some controllers that are growing out to thousands of lines of code and you want to break that out and make it more modular. Well, in a really nice presentation by Jeremy Elborn called Organizing Your Angular Application, there's some great information about different techniques that can be used for really large applications. So they'll walk through everything from the file structure, which I think is a very subjective thing, to how we can reuse code a lot more and also break out code when that code is just getting too big to manage. So if you're interested, he'll walk you through kind of the old way we do things. I kind of still like the old way to be real honest for the folders. But uh, he'll also walk through the new way, which is more of a feature-based approach as far as the folder structure goes. And then he also goes into different examples of actually working with logic. And if you do have these big controllers, how we can break those out and different things that we can do with that. That would include things like services or just some composability or aggregation of code. So definitely check out the talk. A lot of great info there, especially if you're building some enterprise scale AngularJS applications. Well, thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Web Weekly. I hope you found some good content here that you can apply to your everyday needs, or maybe you're just trying to keep up with technology, which is a challenge, and want to learn about some of the great new technologies that are coming out. Now, if you have any suggestions, whether it's for the videos or for the newsletter itself, I'm always open to checking out different articles. So feel free to catch me on Twitter, at Dan Walleen, or you can go to my blog, which is weblogs.esp.net slash dwalleen. And feel free to send any suggestions there. I'll definitely check them out. Thanks again for tuning in. I'd like to thank Interface Technical Training for allowing me to use their studio to film this. I really appreciate that. And if you're interested in some of the live classes I teach, you can actually go to interfacett.com and you can get more information about our remote live technology. And this allows you to take a class on JavaScript or HTML5 or C Sharp or AngularJS online from anywhere in the world and you'll have access to all the code and views that a student locally would have. Plus, you can actually see the instructor as well. It's a really cool experience. So I hope to see you online at some point, and thanks again for tuning in.